Can we praise God for that? How powerful is that? Amen. Well, I want you to stand on your feet. If you're watching online, stand, sit. We're going to stand. Hey, we are, we are beginning a, a brand new series on uh, the covenant that God has for you and I. God thinks and he, he speaks and he relates to us in covenant. And so I think it's important for us to know how to uh, think like God thinks and how to relate to him and how we understand his love and the depth of his love and the, the way that he views relationship. And so we're going to look at that in a number of, of different ways. This weekend, we're going to study the relationship of the Father. And I know God is going to meet us in, in these moments together. This is Jeremiah chapter 31. Verse 31 through 34, it says this, The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, even though I love them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives saying, you should know the Lord for everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, says the Lord. And I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again remember their sins. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, today as we bring our hearts to you, we ask that Lord, you would begin a work in us. Lord, help us think in covenant. Help us speak in covenant. Help us live from a a covenant understanding of how you love us. And Lord, what that means, how it, Lord, it's invited us into a place of intimacy with you where there's healing and there's wholeness. There's a foundation for us to live our lives. And we welcome you. We ask you to speak to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You know, before we, we get going too far in, in this, I want to clear up and make sure everyone everyone's understands something. So, you know, we had we had our vote, and, and now we're getting to step in. And, and just to clear up any confusion, uh, Anna did vote for me. So I want you to know that. I was able. It took a lot of hard conversations, but, but I got her vote. And so... <laughs> You know, God, God is the creator of covenant. He's the one that, that created the, the, probably the most familiar covenant that, that you and, and I are, are seeing and, and that we see and that we talk about the most is the marriage covenant. But God, in, in his immediate interaction with mankind, he, he interacted and the relationship was based in this word covenant. He had a covenant with with, uh, Adam and Eve. He had a covenant with Abraham. He had a covenant with Moses. God relates to us in covenant. You know, covenant speaks such a different value. It's it's not a contract. God doesn't direct us to, to act and to live in covenant in business. And so contracts are necessary. Contracts aren't bad. They're They're good. But what, what happens is when our, when our hearts begin to think and we live from a place of contract and not from a place in covenants in the relationships that God has directed us to live in covenant, then, then things go sideways pretty quick. And there's not a firm foundation to live our lives. There's not a firm foundation to function as a husband or as a wife. And so we're going to go through these, these subjects one by one in the places that God's invited us to live in covenant. The first that we're going to cover uh, is the covenant that we have with the Father. And th- this week has been a, been a wonderful week. It's just been amazing as I begin to study and, and just pray and bring my heart to the Lord and say, Lord, I know that you've invited us into relationship and covenant with you in this place of intimacy, this place of of the, this unconditional love that you have for us. But Lord, I want to understand that from the perspective of you as my father. 
And, and it, once you, you ask the Lord these things and you begin to go down that road, it's amazing how it just explodes. And you, and you just see the Word of God from this filter that, that I had never seen it at this depth before. You know, this weekend, I get, to, I get to preach from a place, and this is going to sound funny, but I'm more confident preaching today than, than I probably ever have been because of, of when I look at the ministry of Jesus and I look at the message that he walked and he talked with and, and the purpose of him going to the cross, I see it clearer than I ever, I ever have before that he went to the cross to restore our relationship with God the Father. Foundational theology tells us that God is three in one. He is God the Father, He is God the Son, Jesus, and He is also God the Holy Spirit. All equal, all these, these beautiful three in one unity that, that speaks to, to us of, of the love and the majesty and the glory and the power that God alone has. And the, the, the relationship that we have with God, it, we, we cannot allow it to just be this overarching, far off, you may have heard some refer to God as the man upstairs, and, and, and it, that, that hurts my heart every time I hear that, because it insinuates that God, who paid a price greater than any price that's been paid, would be okay with a distant relationship from his kids. He's not. And so this identity that, that we have and this relationship of intimacy that we are called to have with God as our Father, it's not one that the enemy wants you and I to have in an easy way. It's actually been something that, that he works against and has worked against from the, the creation, the, the, the first moments of time as, as man began to, to live he, the enemy, Satan, began to corrupt the picture of the Father. This is the book of Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. It says, look, I'm sending you the prophet Elijah. This is John the Baptist. Before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives, his preaching will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. I want to submit to you that, that today we are living and we can see the effects of this curse around us. And I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I just want us to, to be aware that the picture of the Father has been corrupted in a large way. Today, where the, the, the most dangerous place for a child is the, the mother's womb, speaks to us that the voice of security and value of a father is missing. The fact that one in four live in a home that does not have the presence of a father, and I'm not just talking about a biological father, I'm talking about a stepfather, I'm talking about uh, any type of father figure. One in four. Because the enemy knows that, that if, if he can remove the voice of the Father, he can corrupt the image of our Father. He knows if I can stop that, if I can make you second guess what a father is and whether or not a father is trustworthy and whether or not he's faithful. I mean, think about this. The, all the leading atheist voices of our day, Freud, Karl Marx, Bertrand Russell, Madeline Murray, O'Hare, Nietzsche, all of them messed up relationships with their father. Not one of them had a good relationship with their dad. The enemy knows if he can corrupt this, then what happens when you do not have a healthy view as God as a father, then you must reinterpret the role of a father. And it pushes and, and, and leads us to these places where, where we, we can see Romans 1, when there is a rejection of God and you reject him as the father, the good father that is trustworthy and sees and has a plan and loves, and we reject that, the end is confusion. The end is, is no stability or place that we have to live from. And so... 
this weekend, we're going to invite the Lord to step in as the Father. You know, you see this pattern with the children of Israel. You see, you see this pattern of of fathers and the voice of a father. And so you have God establishes a covenant with his people and he establishes it with, establishes it with Moses. And Moses, as this spiritual father, very imperfect and yet was able to hand down the, the intimacy of relationship. God said that he talked with Moses, not, not as, as he did with the children of Israel, but he talked with him as a friend face to face. And that was his heart for, for all of his people. But they said, no, Moses, it's fine. You, you go, you talk with God, and then you tell us what he said. And that'll be our relationship. And so as long as there was that strong voice of Moses that, that was connected with God the Father and, and receiving from him and then giving his people what he said, then things were okay. Imperfect, not God's best, but they were okay. Moses handed off to Joshua. And then we get to one of the, the hardest books to read in the Bible is the book of Judges. The book of Judges starts and, and it starts and it, and, it, and it makes this statement that the voice of Joshua was no longer known. Joshua had died and you have this vacuum, this missing place that a father's voice that had been there to bring stability and bring direction Leadership for God's people was no longer there. And, and this cycle that had started and, and the children of, of Israel, God's people went from this place of solely devoted worship to God to where they began to mix. And then worship was diluted with what they saw around them. Worship was even more diluted and, and, and began to, to look very similar to the pagan worship that was all around them. Ending with the final chapter in the book of, of Judges where a father thinks that, that he would have to sacrifice his daughter to be pleasing to God. It's so sad that it, it would ever get to that place. What happened? The order that God had set up and said the fathers are to, to direct and lead their families, to carry my heart, to be my heart to my people. When that father's voice, both corporately in leadership in Joshua and individually with the fathers leading their homes, when that went away, then the image of God was corrupted to where his people confused him with the pagan worship that they saw everywhere else. This, this cycle just continued and continued over and over again. Jesus steps in. And it, it's interesting to me, you know, we get to Malachi, and Malachi is this indictment where God is saying, I, I've called you to be fathers and you're unfaithful fathers. I've called you to be generous and, and, and you're selfish. And I'm calling you back. Listen, the first thing that you got to know, your response to me is that the fathers turn their hearts to the sons, to their children. And children turn their hearts to their fathers. That was his cry. And then we have 400 years of silence. I want to submit to you that those 400 years were not silent because God didn't want to communicate with his people. There were 400 years of silence because his people said, you know, we're good. We're going to stay in our religious traditions and we're okay without your voice. Getting to the point where his son, God the Father, sends his son to his people and because of their disconnection from the voice of the Father... They couldn't recognize him. The ministry of Jesus is to restore the divide between the Father and our hearts. We get our view of God from our fathers. If you're a single mom and you're here and you're saying, well, what about me? Listen, this is you and God together. Because your heart is submitted to him, because you've invited him, I want to submit to you, you're not deficient. He, as the good father, fills every void, the weakness that we have. There's not a single one of us that can claim to be a perfect father. 
I love being a father. I, I remember 12 years ago, Zoe Clara Hall entered the world. And I had, I had an amazing moment. I was so excited. Anna and I were just, just beyond thrilled. It's, it's just one of the, the most incredible moments that you can experience. I remember the, the nurses, they set her over to the side to weigh her and to clean her. And, and I went over there, and she was crying. And, and, and I, had, I had made sure throughout, you know, Zoe's, Anna's, Anna carrying Zoe that, that I always would, every night I'd go over and I'd talk to her. And I'd say like, hey, hey, this is your daddy. I'm going to tell you terrible jokes one day. It's going to be great. You're going to get really tired of them, but, but you're going to love them anyway. It's going to be great. And I talk to her and I pray over her. And so there was this just special moment. I went over and, and I put my pinky into her hand. And I said, it's Zoe, it's your daddy. And that crying baby settled because she heard her daddy's voice, and, and, and I was, it was like I put my, my pinky out there, and she took her pinky and just wrapped me all the way around it. It was over. I, I, love, I love being a dad. I'm a dad to five girls and one boy. I started going, Lord, I don't know how to, how to raise girls. How am I going to do this? And now I'm going, Lord, girls are easy. How do I do this? with this man child. <laughs> Jesus used the term father 164 times in referring to God. This was disorienting for the Jewish people. They 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 knew God. They knew him as Yahweh. They knew him as Jehovah. They knew him as Jehovah Jireh. They knew him as these, these things, but he was great and he was powerful and, and, and Father was intimate. And yet, Jesus walked him and referred to him over and over and over as our Father. When he directed us to pray, what did he tell us to pray? He said, pray, our Father. The ministry of Jesus is the ministry that brings us into intimacy with the Father. It was disorienting for them. They were comfortable with Father Abraham. Everyone remember the Father Abraham song? That was fine. They would say, Abraham is our father, Isaac and Jacob. We're fine with that. But this God is our father. That's close. That's intimate. You know, the, the wounds that come from the brokenness of earthly fathers are deep wounds. They're shaping wounds. I don't know what kind of dad that, that you had growing up. Maybe you had a, 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 a missing seat at the dinner table that was due to a tragic circumstance. Maybe your dad was very passive. Maybe he was someone that, that just didn't seem interested enough to, to make decisions and help direct. He just was too busy. Maybe you had a dad that was abusive and, and angry and harsh and treated you more like a drill sergeant. All of us have, regardless, even if we've had dads that have been good dads, Every single one of us, because of the imperfection of man and our sin nature, have father wounds that must be taken to the good father. There is a, a place of, of settling, a place of rest, a place of peace that is only brought to our hearts by the good father. This is the place that we're called to live from. I just have three, three steps for us in walking in relationship with God the Father. The first is that we receive him. We receive God as Father. Now think about this. This is John, the Apostle John, who walked with Jesus. He said this in 1 John 3, 1, See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. You know, these father wounds that, that keep us from God, 
and keep us from receiving what he wants to speak to us as a father. They keep us in this place of self-defense. They keep us in this place of having to make it on our own. And so much of it, our, our, our brokenness that is seen in our lives, we can trace back to these places where we've been pushed to that we feel like we're on our own, that we've gone through trauma. You know, and thinking about this weekend, one of the, the examples that really came to mind, because sometimes it's not always just the father figure that we have or don't have. Sometimes it's the authority figures that have been in our lives. I have a, a very close friend that he, he played uh, Division I football, and he was a linebacker at, at one of the top universities in the nation. And I, I love college football. Um, I love to watch college football. I grew up in Oklahoma, and in Oklahoma, at that time, there weren't any pro teams. Um, they didn't have the, the Thunder, and, and so it was, it was oh, the Oklahoma Sooners. You had, you had two choices, the Oklahoma Sooners or their little stepbrother, the Oklahoma State Cowboys. <laughs> And so we, I grew up as a Sooner fan. It's funny, my uncle, he went to OSU, went to Oklahoma State, and he did everything he could to recruit me. He took me to football games. He took me to baseball games. He did everything he could. And I would go, enjoy myself, and I'd wear my Sooner hat everywhere <laughs> that we went. So I love college football. And as I talked with my friend, there was a part of me that, that just was like just so disturbed and so bothered. Because so many young men are, are, are sent and entrusted by families to college football coaches. And my friend went to a, he went to a great Christian school, had incredible football coaches, affirming, coached him hard, but coached him well. Coached him without crushing his spirit. Coached him without, without insulting and breaking down that, that part of his heart. And he gets to this, and as a freshman, he was an incredible athlete. So as a freshman, he, he went in, and he went in early. And so he got there for spring ball and, and, and got just thrown into the mix really early. And he didn't know the defense. He didn't know the calls. And, and, and they did it on purpose. They, they put it in there just to see how he would respond. And, and he didn't respond well. He didn't do well with it. And in front of the entire team, the head coach dressed him down told him what a waste of a scholarship he was, told him what a waste of a person he was. They get back to the, to the, the you know, after practice, and they're watching film of practice, and the, the defensive coordinator in front of the entire defensive team stands up, says his name, points out what he did wrong, and told him that your dad should have settled, and I'll say this nicely, for a lesser sexual experience so he didn't even have you. I hope that shocks you. I, I, hope, it, I hope that there's a part of you that, that, that is disturbed because when the voice and the view of the good father is corrupted and we just go and we continue in these cycles, the father wounds, they don't stop. They just continue and continue in just different environments. And if there's a part of you that said, well, that's just coaching them up. That's just football culture. Well, that's ungodly. And I love football. I love to watch football. But there was a part of me that heard that was like, oh, man, you just run to everything. <laughs> How do I support that? My friend's a believer. His experience at, at the Division I level was not, not a great experience. It was that way for the entirety of his time. Now, the wonderful thing is, is because he's a believer, that there's not a place that, that our hearts can get crushed that the good Father can't put us back together. And I've watched the Lord restore him, and I've watched how God has met him in that. We've got to receive him as the good Father. Number two, from that place of receiving sonship and as a daughter, we live as a son, as a daughter, not as an orphan. Romans 8 says, so you've received a spirit that, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. 
Now we call him Abba, Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm we are God's children. We're not orphans. We don't have to live as fearful slaves. You know, Ephesians 5, and this is one of the the main separations that that I want us to, to see and to hear for what the voice of a father should do and speak. Ephesians 5 says that the call of the husband is to speak love. The husband should love their wives as God loves the church. And then it says that the wives should respect their husbands. You know, the role of a father, the role of the good father, is to answer the question that every heart has. Every heart of every girl has this question, am I worthy of love? And when that question goes unanswered, when that question is left filled in, then we have this continual place of going and trying to prove that, I, that I'm worthy of love. That I, I got to do whatever it takes to be loved. I got I to run and, and, and make sure. And, and, and there's this unending cycle of restlessness that the Father wants to heal and speak to. And for young men, for boys, there's that question that, that they have in their hearts of, am I enough? Is my strength enough? Do I have what it takes to make it, to succeed? You know, I love, my my son Brooks is seven, and we love to wrestle, we love to play. Brooks' love language is wrestling. He he just, it's got to be something violent or his heart's not happy. He just, he just has this, this wonderful aggression in me, in him. And so, like, there, there are times that, that, We'll all wrestle, and the girls, they're cheap shot artists. They, they jump in, and they'll, they'll do things. But Brooks, he, he tests his strength. And I know that, that, that my role as a dad is to give him a gauge. And so when Brooks hits me, it's very different than when the girls hit me. Because they'll hit, and they'll, they'll you know, run. And, and they're, they're cheap shot artists. They can make it hurt. But Brooks, like, he lets me, he lets me know it's coming. And he'll, he'll wind up from, like, back here. And I'll tell him, all right, right there. We'll see what you got. Come on. And with as hard as he can, he'll blast me. And I'll say, man, if I wanted a kiss, I would have asked your mother, Brooks. What's the But there's a question that Brooks has, is my strength enough? Am I able to do it? Is what I am, is it enough to make it in life? And the voice of a father is the voice that's there and says, you're going to make it. Your strength is enough. I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to be here with you. But man, you, you you are so good. You're going to be a great husband. You're going to be a great dad. To affirm these places, these questions in our heart. And when that doesn't happen, then we fall into this place of having to try to prove ourselves. It was interesting, last week, Pastor Tom asked me about just how the, you know, my relationship with my dad has been. I got a great dad. And he, and he said, you know, tell me about you know, growing up and working in ministry with your dad, did you ever feel like you had to, to fill his shoes? And, and, I, and I happily said, no. I, no, I, I never felt that way. Dad, in, in all his imperfection, he, he spoke a security into me where I never felt like I was having to prove myself as worthy to him. The most important thing that I, I look back, and man, Dad and I, we've, we've had some amazing moments. I love, my dad is a, an incredible wrestler. He wrestled for the U.S. Navy, wrestled in college, and then his oldest son decided to play basketball at a certain age. You know what he did? He didn't complain. He went out there, and he played basketball with me, and he's a wrestler. If you've ever seen a wrestler play basketball, it's not pretty. He would shoot it. There was no arc to it. It was like this chest press, bench press shot that it was either going to break the backboard, bend the rim, or it was going to go in. And he got out there. But the most powerful moments and memories that I have of my dad were the times that, that he sat with me and said, son, I'm sorry. 
And he was willing to apologize and sit with me and talk through times where he didn't measure up to the father that, that he wanted to be and that God had put in his heart to be. And that's a place of security that you can only get to when you know that you're secure with the good father. And you know how the good father sees you and how the father looks at you and how he receives you. And that's what God wants for our hearts. The third step that, that, that God has for us is that we father or that we lead as a son or a daughter. See, God's work in our life is multi-generational. It's not supposed to, to stop. We're called to be an ambassador bringing people to him, reconciling people to him. It's what he's called us to do. I want you to know there's healing for father wounds. There's healing from the wounds that a harsh father or a disconnected father, a passive father, a missing father, an abusive father, God the Father wants to step in. He wants to heal those wounds that fill our lives, that try to rob us of peace, try to rob us of the rest and the foundation that he's called us to live from. You know, Jesus' words, they get really clear when we, we begin to see that and we, we hear him say, come to me, all who, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There's never been a man on earth, a man or a woman, that has ever been more secure than Jesus. More resolute in their identity and who they knew they were and what they were called to do. And that was his heart. When he looks at you and I and, and he sees us and he, then he turns to the Father and he says, I, I want them to be one as you and I are one. Listen to John chapter 16. This is Jesus telling his disciples, talking about what would happen as he died paying the price for our sins, then would return to heaven. He says, at that time, you won't need to ask me for anything. I tell you the truth, you will ask the Father directly, and he will grant your request because you use my name. You haven't done this before. Ask using my name and you will receive and you will have abundant joy. He says there's no separation. The price that Jesus paid gives us intimacy with the Father. I don't know how you view the Father. I don't know how you, you see him today. You may see him as distant. You may see Jesus as the one that is easier to talk to. The one that's easier to relate to, because quite honestly, I mean, who doesn't love somebody that dies for you? But don't miss the intimacy that the Father wants to have with you, the closeness. He finishes in verse 25 and says, I've spoken all of these matters and figures of speech, but soon I will stop speaking figuratively and will tell you plainly all about the Father. Then you will ask in my name, I'm not saying I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you dearly because you love me and believe that I came from God. I don't want us to miss the, the, the place of fellowship that we have because of the new covenant. I don't want us to miss the intimacy in that place that we don't have to strive I love the, the, the videos. If you've ever seen a, a video, there are two videos that, that just wreck me every time I see them. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if this is you or not, but like the two videos are this. You know the, the surprise videos when the military comes back and their kids or their wives don't know they're coming back and they surprise them? That wrecks me every time. That's the one. The other are the moments of adoption when I, I see parents that are adopting kids. And they tell them that, that they would like to adopt them if they would want to be part of their family. You know what we miss when we don't see the Father right and we can, we can have a relationship with God where we believe in Jesus and, and we love Jesus, but when there's not intimacy with the Father, we have a limited 
adoption moment with God. And he doesn't want it to be limited. He wants to be able to speak the value that he has set on your life. And every single heart needs to to know that because that's the place that he's called us to live from. I want to ask you to bow your heads, if you will. If you're watching online, my heart is that, that, that God would meet you right where you're at. In just a moment, I'm going to invite our, our prayer team up to the front, and, and we've directed them just a little differently this weekend. And they're going to be here to, to pray over just any of the prayer needs that we have, but they're also prepared that if you know that, that you're, you're in a place where your, your view of God as Father has been corrupted, maybe you're holding on to unforgiveness towards your dad. And maybe he's not even available to, to, to reconcile with. Maybe he's already stepped into eternity and you feel stuck and you don't know what to do with that unforgiveness. God, the Father, wants to wrap you in his arms and tell you that he loves you and that he set a value that is higher than any other value on your life. And it's in that place that we're able to release and we're able to forgive. You know, the thing I didn't tell you about my dad is my dad was raised by an abusive womanizer. He didn't see, dad didn't grow up with any kind of a good example. He grew up with a man that that pretended and said he was a believer and then lived in an opposite way. Was so physically abusive to dad as the oldest And what the enemy had intended and tried to plant and do that would go for generations, the blood of Jesus spoke a better word. So I got to be raised by a man that wasn't jaded, but had a close, intimate relationship with the Father. And he wasn't perfect, but he pointed me to the perfect Father by the way that he apologized, by the way that he was open, by the way that he was consistent and lived with integrity. That's what God's called us to. I want to pray over you, and then I'm going to invite our prayer teams to the front. God, thank you for the way that you see us. God, thank you that you're the good Father. Lord, and you want us to know know you in that way today. Lord, you're not okay with there being distance. Jesus, you're not okay with there being distance between our hearts and the fathers. And so, Lord, regardless of the examples of fathers that we have, God, I pray that today we would know you as the good father. Lord, I pray courage over everyone that that is wrestling and struggling with this, that haven't had a good example of a father. And their heart is filled with pain, and Lord, that's pain that you want to heal. Lord, there's joy on the other side of a response to you. And Lord, I pray that you'd meet him in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen.